Viewers of Postscript, I'm Ken Harmon, editor of West Trade Review, and today I have someone uh, very special here with us. This is uh, poet Laura Ullman. Uh, Laura is a Florida poet who graduated from the MFA program at Central University of Central Florida. Her work is forthcoming in the Rumpus, the Linden Review, and Saul Palm, and her work has also appeared in the Main Review, Gasher, West Trade Review, and the South Florida Poetry Journal, and others. She enjoys sleeping in her converted Honda Element and biking up mountains uh, with her partner and her dog. And she currently tells me she's in Oklahoma City right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for the introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for being with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, so I was wondering if we could just start, you know, with, uh, with your childhood, actually. I think like for a lot of writers, um, whatever that thing is that makes us writers sometimes, I, I think it often starts there <laughs> yeah. in our childhood. So I was wondering if you could just speak to some of your childhood experiences and perhaps some of those things and aspects of that stuff that you think shapes your work now. Yeah, of course. Um, so when I was growing up, I had difficulty learning how to read. And so my mother and sister um, really helped me like speed that along. So I think it was third or fourth grade we were reading because of Winn-Dixie. And so my mom bought two copies of the book. Um, my sister picked up a third copy from the library so that we could all read it together. Um, and so that it would, you know, encourage me to want to read <laughs> because I really struggled with um, being able to read out loud in enunciation. So it was a real difficulty with wanting to read books in general. Uh, my mom eventually got um, an autoimmune illness with friends in my family. And she was in and out of uh, hospitals for two years before her passing. Um, and while she was going in and out of hospitals, we picked up the Harry Potter series, which I know is not you know, a very popular thing to talk about these days, but um, Harry Potter really helped me through you know, going in and out of the hospital. And my sister picked me up a notebook and, you know, grief kind of speeds you along with, you know, whatever your passion is. It sure uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so eventually I started writing after she passed away, you know, in um, sixth grade, we started learning how to write haikus and tankas. And um, I mean, I love that. My Some of my friends didn't enjoy writing haikus, so I'd write theirs for them <laughs> for class assignments. And it just kind of sped along from there. Um, so what was it that you think the writing gave you that you found comfort in? Uh, it mostly gave me a, a release, you know, the way reading does, you know, it, it transports you into a different world. Um, poetry in particular now is something that I, I lean on more than fiction or even nonfiction, which I also love. Um, but poetry tends to be well, the poetry I read tends to be very vulnerable and family centric. Um, so I really gravitate towards writing that way as well. You know, I mean, I'm sure eventually it'll branch out, but, um, you know, image driven, um, honest writing like that really speaks to me. Are there any poets in particular that influenced you? I noticed, for instance, in your um, in your work, there's like a, a deeply personal and sort of confessional tone sometimes. I was thinking of specifically uh, to Justin that you published in South, <laughs> South Florida Poetry Review and Mother Ode that we published in West Trade Review back in the winter. Um, and when I first approached you for the interview, you mentioned that you were a bit of an introvert, I think like most writers. <laughs> yes. Um, but is it difficult for you to uh, to be so vulnerable on the page? Yeah, um, I, I started out in this workshop where it originated at PBSC, which is Palm Beach State University in Lake Worth. I didn't go to that school, but I had friends who went to that college and they kind of created their own mini undergraduate cohort there. And one of the things that we focused on um, you know, as new students of poetry was to tell secrets on the page because that was kind of the writing prompt every week. And so we would bring in new poets um, that became my favorite poets, which were Sharon Olds and Yusef Kamenyaka and Leung Lee and Philip Levine, Rita Dove, you know, yeah. and they 
they became the focal point of our group. You know, we'd bring in their books every week and um, pick a poem to read out loud and then, you know, try to imitate one of the poems, you know, as a way of starting out. And um, I think that's really carried through in my writing, like just being vulnerable and confessional and just um, truth telling, you know, talking about family. Yeah, when I was when I was looking over some of your work that I thought of Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath, you know, that confessional sort of type of work, because there is that deeply personal voice, like I, like I was saying. Um, so at your MFA program, was there something about that program that you learned that you you think was important to your work and that you that is sort of carried out you've carried on with that after you finished the program yeah um and the program you know we learn one of the things i feel like you learn when you're in your graduate program when you're first starting out is just how to write more and become more comfortable with your own voice so most of the time i was floating around between you know and the um, imitational styles, you know, between different writers, and it's just kind of developing your own voice and getting used to that. Um, so one of the things I picked up was just reading a different book of poetry every week. And um, one of the things that my professors, Terry Ann Thaxon, taught us was to write a prose poem every week and then lineate it afterwards. And I found that really freeing also, because you just get it all out on the page. And then once you start lineating and you know editing, removing material that's not totally necessary, um, you really start to develop your voice in that way too. Right. Um, so I was wondering if you'd be willing to share some of your experience of writing Mother Ode, which we uh, published back in the uh, winter. Um, and if you could talk about what that was like for you, the process of writing that poem. Uh, there's so many things I love about it. Um, I think the thing that hit me the hardest when I first read it that first time was that image of the mother dolphin with her dead calf. Oh, <laughs> so powerful. Um, so did you initially, when you started writing that poem, did you begin with that image or was it something that came about later on in the process of revision? So if you could just sort of talk about your process of Yeah, of course. I do think it began with that image initially because I was reading an article about it <laughs> and I was kind of following this dolphin who was carrying her dead calf on her back for, I can't remember if it was weeks or months at a time, but my friend Alicia and I, we were like just watching the news and it was really heartbreaking and we were just following her progress. And eventually, um, you know, she let her calf go and she became pregnant again and, you know, conceived and had a healthy calf. But um, I just came to this poem, you know, thinking about the loss of a child and the loss of like, you know, grief in general, you know, and how it really transports us and how she was literally transporting her grief with her. Um, and it was really moving and how, you know, this isn't directly in the poem, but before my mom passed away, we went to Alaska together and she bought me and my sisters um, a charm for our necklace, which is a dolphin's tail. And so when I thought of this, you know, dolphin carrying her calf, you know, it just kind of wove itself in there. And um, I do feel like it became a little more discursive, like it's moving in and out of different scenes, but kind of what you want to remember in grief, you know, like these are the things I want to remember about my mother. Um, how am I going to interweave these in the poem and, you know, like fully hold on to this moment the way the mother dolphin is holding on to her calf? And it came out through that. And obviously, there was a revision process for it also. <laughs> oh, right. um, like I broke it, like where I broke it up into stanzas and, you know, removed um, parts that were a little too lengthy, um, et cetera. Like at first, it was just one big chunk. <laughs> right, right. I did notice uh, in your work that you do write about family a lot too. So is that sort of your poetic obsession or is there something else as a poet that you're obsessed about? I think we <laughs> all have our thing. <laughs> um, I would say that it definitely cycles in and out of, you know, talking about family. Um, my mom, my mother always seems to be in my writing, no matter how hard I try to 
not forget her because that's definitely why I'm writing, you know, I want to remember her forever and memorialize her. Um, But to try to branch out, but I would say like family is definitely an obsession writing about my mom and it does move a little bit like to becoming about whatever my travels may be. Um, I write about location also, which I really enjoy. I mean, we just visited Asheville, so I wrote a poem about Asheville and my mom. (laughs) Um, So they mend together also. And I think it always will be that way. How how has writing been beneficial for you with maybe helping you deal with the weight of grief? Um, I think you're... Or understanding it, maybe. Yeah. Um, I think through grief, you know, being able to write about this person, um, like getting it out on the page is, is just helpful. And I'm not sure how to put it exactly, but always having these poems carry me through. Like I've been writing steadily for the past, like, you know, trying to professionally write for the past five to seven years. I mean, I Uh wrote when I was a teenager all the time, obsessively in a notebook, but those poems were the way a lot of beginning writers are. They're not very image centric, you know, a lot of abstractions. Um, But once you like start being able to form images in your poetry and you go back in time and look at them, you realize that there are things you forget all the time, you know, so when you're writing like either through a journal or poem or nonfiction or even fiction, you know, because people write autobiographically, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just a way of remembering things that you often forget um, and being able to be creative with it, you know, lyrical and, you know, having your reader understand and feel the same way that you felt in that moment when you wrote the poem is a beautiful thing. You know, I love reading Um, people's poetry about the coronavirus you know like on poets respond you see you know pieces about the news all the time and how people respond to it in their various locations Um, and I just find it beautiful you know to relate to someone you don't know at all and be transported into their location and their memory and um, it's just really moving (laughs) it it really is speaking of moving could you uh, read mother ode for us now Yeah, of course. Okay. Mother Ode. A mama dolphin carries her dead calf through the Bay of Islands, dropping her young occasionally off her nose and back, but she keeps circling back to scoop up the remains. I had an abortion, willingly expunged a body from my body, heard the vacuum device, like the one that sucked blood from around my mother's mouth as she lay dying. The Torah says there are five stages of mourning. For my mother, we clothed the mirrors, every reflective surface in black fabric, sat for seven days to memorialize her throaty laugh, the tips of her acrylics, her love for America's most wanted, circus peanuts and picnics that she ate by the handful. For you, my unborn one, the one I cast out towards the fleeing water, I try to write you poetry. It wasn't enough. I searched for your body in Google images. What does three month old fetus look like? Did you have a heartbeat or toes? Would I have named you Sarah after my mother? You were the length of my hand. A mama dolphin carries her dead calf on her back through the Bay of Islands. But I let you be transported from my body. If I had circled back, what would have remained? So powerful (laughs) and beautiful (laughs) thank you oh thank you um so i noticed that in your work there are natural images up here quite a good bit they pop up in your poems a lot it seems and in arrhythmia that we're publishing in the upcoming edition of west trade review i noticed there was um a mention of the grasshoppers in the poem and and maybe it was the rhythm of they're hitting the sidewalk or something that you sort of associated with the with the arrhythmia of your mother's heart and I thought that was powerful and of course she also mentioned junipers and cottonwoods and all these other things too so I was wondering if you could just sort of talk a little bit about um 
how it is that the natural world seems to become such an integral part of every poem that you write, or, or a lot of them anyway. Yeah, of course. Um, oftentimes, I, ins I get inspiration from nature. Um, you know, you go on a walk, you go outside your front door and your car, etc. cetera. Um, you just take in the natural world around you. And, you know, when I'm in my hometown of Cooper City, I... I see my mom everywhere, you know, all the little things we used to do together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was recently walking to Publix in Cooper City, which is the grocery store there, um, I should say. <laughs> and um, there were grasshoppers everywhere all over the sidewalk, and you have to be really careful to not step on them. <laughs> you know, there were like thousands of them all over the sidewalk, and they're, wow. you know, jumping up and hitting your calves. And so I was there for a few weeks visiting my dad and, you know, visiting her grave. Um, and I noticed that as the season went on, um, the grasshoppers were dying. <laughs> um, and so as you're walking to the store, which is a half a mile from my childhood home, um, you would start to see their bodies on the sidewalk instead um, as the season is ending. And so, I don't know, just being, you know, there and seeing this like cycle of birth and Right. life and grief um I mean it, it pretty easily was able to relate it to my mom <laughs> right, you know right. that's such a powerful image <laughs> <laughs> so would you say you're happiest sitting at your desk writing poems or exploring the outdoors so I know yeah. you mentioned that you love traveling around in your Honda element <laughs> and hiking with your partner and your dog yeah um or, or mountain biking right yeah, I enjoy hiking yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say there's something freeing to being outdoors, you know, and just experiencing this um, new birth and life all around you. And just, you know, you're literally right. seeing the seasons and, you know, uh, birds hatch from eggs. And I think it's just gorgeous <laughs> the, the way life is. And while you're experiencing those things, are you writing poems in your head? <laughs> 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 oftentimes yeah. Yeah, me I mean too. they don't always turn out very well but, right <laughs> but I'm always trying you know? well, I think you have a, a couple of really good poems and the one you read a minute ago is just so powerful and I think uh, Arrhythmia is, is just as powerful so I was wondering if you'd read that one for us now yeah of course I appreciate it Arrhythmia you died the last day of spring human warmth taken from you like leaves tumbling from tree branches we used to walk together, Mom, the circle route around Rock Creek, count the springing grasshoppers on the pavement in time to our steps. One, two, three, four, then begin again. This rhythm, like the arrhythmia from your heartbeat fading, that continues every time I see one sprout beneath my feet and rise into the air like a soul in flight. Blood clots formed beneath your skin like ripening berries ready to rot and pop. Some people don't believe in souls, but I saw it when your chest stopped moving before my eyes, not even an adolescent yet. The only blood I ever witnessed was that day pouring from your mouth, a faucet of death wafting from your skin like an essence I wished to capture, kept into my hands and feed back to you. But I couldn't save you, I could only watch. Count the grasshoppers from your hospital window. One, two, your breath pushing out away. So powerful. Thank you so much for being with us okay. today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you um, for having me. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. Anytime, anytime. So um, viewers of West Trade Reviews Postscript, I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed our, our poet today and our reading. I hope you'll come back again with us soon. And if you liked this reading, please like us and follow us on YouTube. Uh, thank you again, Laura. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. <laughs>